Flying Knee is among the most exciting knockout blows to watch. It's an amazing display of athleticism that requires the perfect amount of coordination, timing, and maybe even a little bit of luck to land properly. In this video, we'll explore the biomechanics and the anatomy of this strike. So we're gonna look at three different flying knees in this video, and we'll talk about what contributes to the power generated in each one. Okay, so this is the first view out of three, and the way we're going to do this is I'm gonna look through each video, we're gonna go through it, and then we're gonna talk about, as we go through it, we're gonna talk about what they did well and what could have potentially happened to produce more force should it have been a different scenario, okay? So right away, the first thing that he does really well, he's got a lot of good forward momentum, he timed it really well. If we back up, he hit him with a good round hit to the face, stands up, and times the, the strike really well. So good forward momentum. He's got, he's planting off of the opposite leg that he's striking with, which is a little bit different than what we'll see a little bit later. The hip is relatively extended. It's already coming through, taking advantage of that stretch shorten cycle. Uh, and the hip flexors, like the iliopsoas, or particularly psoas major, rectus femoris, TFL, and as he moves forward, what could have been a little bit better is if he had made contact here as he was on his way up. Because his, his momentum is going more forward than it is up, okay? so which, which does take away a little bit from it. What he does have going for him is he's using his arms as a good counter movement. You'll see a little bit of trunk flexion as he comes up, but he makes contact with his face at almost the highest amount of uh, flexion that he could have. So he doesn't get to fully follow through with his strike. Now, it still does the job, obviously. But one more time, so he plants with the opposite foot. He's going more forward than he is up, which takes away a little bit from it. But he makes contact at the top at a really good spot on his head. He gets that really good whip, that acceleration movement that we know it causes knockouts. And he flexes his trunk a little bit to get that little extra follow through. So the forward momentum, the really good push off from the opposite leg, and the amount of contact that he made surface area wise on his face really did well for him there. Okay, so this view, most of you know what you're looking at. This is the second clip. This is the UFC's quickest knockout to date. Uh, so we'll just start with Masvidal running eye socket hip pocket at Ben. As he does this, I want you to notice a couple of differences from the other clip that we watched. The last one, he was taking off with the opposite leg that he was striking with. The second thing is he's got a lot more forward momentum. He had a lot more speed or a lot more distance to run. And he was, he was able to start using his movement of center of mass to his advantage. As he moves forward in midair, he also takes more of an advantage of that stretch shortened cycle because his hip is more extended and he's able to bring it through a, long, a larger range of motion. With that being said, he didn't bring it as high as he, excuse me, he didn't need to bring it that much higher because Ben almost died after making contact with this, as you guys probably remember. But where he makes contact, I want you to notice that it's not even close to that 90 degree angle that the other hip is closer to, or the other knee is closer to. This angle is what I'm talking about here. So if we remember the last clip, his when he made contact, his knee was way up closer to around his nipple line. This time he's making contact, and part of it has to do with Ben actually diving down uh, and just kind of creating a really shitty situation for himself, but he makes contact at maybe like 20 to 30 degrees of hip flexion. If he had made contact around 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion, a lot more force production muscularly, purely muscularly, okay? So what he's got going for him is his forward speed, the fact that he took off with the same leg that he's striking with so he can get take advantage of that stretch shorten cycle, use the scissoring motion of his legs, and then make contact. He also could have kind of, now Ben did this for him, but he could have clenched and pulled down using some of the bigger muscles in the back. Uh, but again, as we've seen, he did not need to create any more force with this because I was really concerned for Ben when this happened. Let's watch it full speed and then we'll move on to the next one, or slow. Gosh. All right, so this third and final view, and in my opinion, the most powerful flying knee that we are seeing today, is we're gonna look at it in this first view, and we're gonna look at it in the second view. So let's just get right into it. We'll look at his striking leg. 
look how far back behind him that leg is. Okay, so again, we beat it to death, but that stretch shortened cycle is very important to start from the hip extended. The more extended the hip is at the beginning, the more distance it has to travel and produce more momentum. Now, as he shifts his weight forward, he starts to propel himself upward. We've noticed with the last couple that whenever they were setting this up, they were a longer distance away and had to create momentum coming towards them. Here, he's very close. And so he's actually close enough to be able to clinch what we'll talk about in a second, uh, which I think increases the amount of force produced here through the strike, uh, among other things. But he's actually driving upward, which I think is very advantageous for him. So as he's moving upward, we'll talk about the amount of hip flexion. He's leaving the ground, kind of loses a little bit of force, but his upward, his, his mass moving forward actually helps him. So I don't think a lot of force production is lost. Uh, but maybe a little bit. It just kind of depends on how much he's compensating with his mass actually moving upward. But look at the hip flexion here. That's right around 90 degrees. You'll notice that the last time we talked about this, the Masvidal kick, or flying knee, it was at like a 20 degree. And then the first one was much higher, probably around the 110 to 120 degree hip flexion. This is where the most power is being produced. Not only that, we'll move up a little higher. He's actually crunching down with the muscles of his anterior trunk, like the internal, external oblique and rectus abdominis. He's also using the big muscles of his back called the lats and extending his hip, or excuse me, extending his shoulders, grabbing the head and pushing it into his knee as he strikes. So like five or six things he's doing perfectly here. I don't think he's wasting anything when it comes to this. Maybe a little bit when he leaves the ground, but again, he's probably compensating for that with the amount of force he's pressing up and his body is actually taking him up. Also helping with the contraction of the hip flexor forward through his, through his face. So one more time with this view, clenches the head, uses the lats to extend his head down into his knee at around 90 degrees and he follows through pretty well there. And you can tell that he didn't lose any of this. Let's move to the, let's move to the next one here. You can tell when he makes contact, he didn't lose any, or he's not like leaking any force for lack of a better term, because once he makes contact, he actually keeps moving up, right? He just kind of floats there. So we know that all of this, all of this energy is being put, <laughs> is being put through this guy's face or through his head. And once he does that, he just kind of floats there. So it's not like he hit him going up. It's not like he hit him going down. He hit him at the exact right spot that he needed to transfer energy to his, uh, to his opponent. So let's watch this all the way through in real speed. Or in, it'll be still be in slow-mo, but. So there you go. Three variations of the flying knee that have different biomechanical and anatomical underpinnings. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.